Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dave Burns. I'm the Story Center Publication Manager with Midcon at Public Library, and we would like to welcome you to the eighth annual local author fair through the Story Center. Um, this last two years, we have been uh, virtual, which has been a unique, but I think really great experience to give our authors a chance to have a platform to share their work. Um, thank you for those who have been with us throughout the day. This is the third of three panels and we've had some wonderful conversations and I've uh, got a chance to meet some great authors. So what we're going to be doing is introducing the authors one at a time. I will let you know there is a Q&A at the end. We're going to set about set aside about 15 minutes for questions and answers. So if you're watching this, feel free to comment and ask your questions, make your comments, and we'll be able to uh, circle back to those towards the end of the program. Uh, also place a link to our survey uh, in the in the comments as well. So that way you be uh, fill that out if you would at the end. Uh, we'd really greatly appreciate that. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first author I'd like to introduce is Madison Main. Madison, welcome for being welcome and thanks for being here. Hi, thank you. So hi everyone. My name is Madison Main. I am 20 years old and I am a self-publishing author in Kansas City, Missouri. I started writing when I was 13, and ever since, I just haven't been able to stop. Um, the book today I am talking about is part of a series, the Lineage series, and the book is called Pendants. And so a little bit about that book, it's about um, the lineage of women, and so specifically with Pendants, um, it's the home to the last survivors of Earth, or at least that's what Cambry Isaac thought. After learning about another civilization on Mars, Cambry begins to question everything. And this was such a special book to be my first book to be released. And it is one of my favorites. And I got a partner with friends from high school to do illustrations and be my editor. That's great, Madison. Thank you so much for sharing and for being here with us. Uh, next author I'd like to introduce is J.R. Underdown. J.R., welcome. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, J.R. Underdown, and uh, my, uh, I'm an independent author here in Kansas City, and uh, originally from Kentucky, um, so I'm a transplant, but uh, I've been here almost a decade now, and I've been having fun. And uh, so, yeah, the book I'm talking about today is The Boyd Bafflers, uh, Volume 1. It is a uh, collection of mystery stories, uh, first of a series that... Uh, the very short elevator pitch is that it's uh, like Scooby-Doo meets Sherlock Holmes at a Bible college. So it's kind of goofy, but it has a little bit of intellectual, uh, the intellectual deduction side to it. Um, but yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a uh, kind of humorous, but also kind of, uh, kind of uh, brain twisty as well. Thank you, JR. That may be one of the best elevator pitches I've ever heard. Um, Next up, we have uh, K.L. Mitchell. K.L., thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, my name is K.L. Mitchell, and I'm here to talk a little bit today about my debut novel, The Road to Kalazan. It's, uh, it's a comedy fantasy sort of book. It's the story about a wandering adventurer named Repka and her girlfriend, who's a centaur, named Yara. And they get in a lot of trouble, and they're forced to trek halfway across the kingdom and back again in order to steal this ancient treasure. Along the way, they keep running to all these sketchy characters like thieves and wizards and con artists and every other kind of person you would ever hope to avoid. And it's just one misadventure after another, and eventually they wind up up to their necks in this conspiracy to take over the whole kingdom. That's that's fantastic. I love fantasy. That sounds that sounds great. Um, and we also have uh, Ramonda here. Ramonda, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So I'm really glad to be here today and I'm excited about my book Pieces. Uh, it's Pieces, Poetry and Prose. And really the, the book is about all things that have to do with hope and healing. This book was birthed from a very uh, difficult times in my life that I made it through. And the premise of Pieces is about finding your emotional peace, your spiritual peace, your mental peace, all of those things that bring about peace overall in your life. And so I'm just really excited to be able to share some of my piece with other people. 
Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, I appreciate you all being here and taking a few minutes to to talk about yourselves and introduce yourselves. And so what we're going to do now is we're just going to kind of move on to some panel discussions. So you'll each have an opportunity to, to answer some of these questions. And then, as I mentioned uh, previously, anyone who's watching, feel free to send in any questions, comments you have. We will have a Q&A at the end, uh, and we'd love to hear from you. So first off, we're going to start off with Madison. Um, and we're going to ask this question, uh, what inspired you to write this piece that you're talking about today? So that is a very good question. I don't remember the exact inspiration for this, um, but I do have the day written in my journal, but I knew I wanted to work with the idea of what would it be like if all of humanity is in space and being forced to live by these rules and you can't disobey them. And like just this whole idea of very different from our world today. And it just evolved into something amazing and the book it is now awesome thank you madison thank you madison uh jr how about you what inspired you to write this uh it's kind of a long story the the shorter version is uh what got me started in the writing fiction was that i would write these really stupid mysteries uh in high school uh with uh, featuring me and my friends in these fictional settings and uh when i got I like I wrote a whole series, like basically freshman year through senior year, in even a novel and uh, got to the end of all that and set, uh, kind of went Arthur Conan Doyle on the series and went like, OK, I'm done. I'm going to move on to more serious things like fantasy. And uh, that's what I'm going to be uh, focusing on. And then while I was in college, uh, a friend of mine uh, read some of the stories and I guess liked them enough because she started nagging me to write new stories uh, featuring uh, a new set of friends that I made in college. And at first, I didn't really want to get back into it. But uh, eventually, uh, she she had a we had a mutual friend that had had a mysterious circumstance happen to them. And so <laughs> she finally convinced me to listen to the story. It did kind of inspire me to uh, try and figure out like, well, what actually happened in this situation. And so that ended up being the first story uh, that just launched uh, the rest of what would become the Boyd Bafflers. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Kale, how about you? What, expi what inspired you to write this piece? Well, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed fantasy books and I've always enjoyed humor. Those are like the two big things that I really got into uh, as a young reader. And so um, I wanted to do something that combined the two and give it something that... Uh, was uh, characters that I really liked because I know that growing up I, I had very few books that had LGBT main characters in them, so I wanted to make something that could you know uh, that would have those characters but would also be something that could appeal to just about anyone. Great, thank you very much. And uh, Ramonda, how about you? What inspired you to write this? I think the main thing that inspired me um, is really trauma. You know, you kind of think to yourself, how does trauma inspire people? Usually trauma invokes thoughts of troubling times. And, and yeah, it was birthed from a lot of that, but not just the trauma itself. It was birthed from the strength that it took to get through those different types of trauma and what happens as you're going through that process to get on the other side. And so, um, you know, I've, I've been writing for a very long time, but it wasn't until last year that I finally got up the nerve to go ahead and publish. And so, um, you know, the writing piece is one of those things for me that is a verse. Your life is a verse. Every, every breath you breathe, every interaction that you have with other people is a verse. It's a lyric in somebody else's life, just that interaction. And so I take that seriously. And you can't have life without hope and healing. So that's where my inspiration came from. Thank you for sharing. And thank you all for, yeah, for sharing those. That's wonderful. Uh, move on to the next question, um, starting with you, Madison. Uh, what is your writing process like for those of who might be watching? Um, so mine, it originally starts with having notebooks that all my books are, I write them in notebooks. So everything is handwritten. So I either buy one that I feel like in the mood that fits a storyline that comes to me. And then I make a playlist. Each of my books has a certain playlist that I listen to when I write. And it just, it's that aesthetic of 
the music and just the energy of me writing, just everything's just in the atmosphere. And so I just have all those together and it, it just is my writing process that I've done for many years and it just helps. And it's one of my favorite parts of doing it. Is that. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Uh, JR, how about you? What's your writing process like? <laughs> it's always changing. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I first started writing the Boyd Baffler, the Boyd Bafflers took like 10 years to write all the stories because I would write other stuff in between the stories. But uh, when I first started doing it, I would write it uh, physically in a notebook and then type it up. So basically the physical copy would be the first draft and then I could just really uh, edit it and get it to where I wanted it to be when I typed it up. Um, along the way, I got married and had kids. And at that point, you just don't have as much time anymore. So I started just going straight to typing and um, really toward the end, it's just kind of writing whenever and wherever and using all the different means either on a computer uh, through a Word document or uh, through a Google document and have access to the cloud. So yeah, kind of all over the place. <laughs> I understand that completely. Yeah. Uh, Kale, how about yourself? What's your writing process like? Well, um, I, I also mostly use uh, Google Drive and stuff just because it is available all the time, no matter what machine I'm on. I can just grab it and pick up and get working on it. As for how I do the books, I kind of use a, a least to greatest detail kind of thing. I'll start with the basic idea, and I'll come up with a three act breakdown. And then I'll, I'll do it like an outline where I work out all the major beats. And then after that comes a, a chapter by chapter uh, listing of, of what I want to have happen to get me all the way through to the end. And then I sit down and write it and it goes completely differently. But that's actually okay. But I, I like having that structure there because I always know what I'm writing towards and I've got the, the general shape of the story in front of me. So I don't have to worry about writer's block. That being said, the story always had the only, the story knows how it's supposed to go, and you know if you if it, you get a point where it's not working, that's its way of telling you no, you need to be going another way. So I, I tend to follow the story when it comes to going a different direction. Yeah, that's so. It sounds like you you do a lot of planning and then put out the plan and then kind of uh, follow where the story goes with that. Pretty much, yeah. That's a that's a good plan. That's good. Uh, Ramonda, how about you? What's your writing process like? I'm a little less conventional. Uh, my process is not always the same. Sometimes I'll get inspired by something that I see out in nature. So I do a lot of walking. Um, and I also get what I call God downloads. <laughs> and so sometimes um, it's literally I'm sitting down to my computer. I'm sitting down to a notebook. And literally, it's like I'm transcribing uh, things that I can't memorize because they didn't come directly from me, the person. They came from divine intervention and uh, not to be, you know, over religious or anything like that, but just explaining that everything that I write is divinely inspired. I don't I don't write things just because I think it's awesome to write and because I'm so wonderful. <laughs> you know, that's not my process. My process is that I wait for it to come to me. And sometimes that comes in bits and pieces. Sometimes that may be a topic. Sometimes I'll get the meat first and then I'll get the title later. Uh, sometimes I'll get things that I may have the title, but he may not you know, send the, the actual content until months or even years later. There have been certain pieces that I've written that I thought, well, what am I supposed to do with this? But then lo and behold, as time goes on, um, you know, I am a Christian. And so what will happen is I believe that God gives me what I'm supposed to write for what specific topic. And sometimes that is for specific people. Um, there was a lady that I met in, um, in a restaurant one day and she just struck up a conversation and we just began to talk. And she tells me about her husband that battled cancer and all these other things. And I just felt led to give her a copy of my book. And as soon as she saw the topic and the cover, she just broke out in tears. Mm -hmm. And so you just don't know how what you write will touch other people. And I think that that's something to take very seriously as a writer. Oh, yes. Thank you for sharing. And that's, you know, I think we all are writing because we we feel it's important, you know, what we're putting out there. So thank you for sharing that, all of you. Um, 
So on that, in that same vein, um, I know we've had some very challenging times as of late. So how has your writing process changed during these new times? Madison, we start with you. Um, I would say I explored more with more having note cards with my next book in the series. It was, it had more notes than my other books had because I was just filled with everything I would see, like what you were talking about, uh, Ramonda, like just being outside, seeing something or hearing conversation, just different perspectives of people. And I took that in consideration of, oh, I need a, this is interesting. I'm, I really like what they said or this topic of something. And I've just explored um, with just deep, like diving in to the surroundings I have and taking more notes and using that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, JR, how about you? Has your writing process changed during this time? Not really. Okay. <laughs> well, at least not because of the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> we, we bought a house this year. So between mm -hmm. uh, housework and uh, our kids are toddler age. So it's between all that, it's uh, I've changed my process from just doing it whenever, uh, for the most part, to trying to get up early before going to work. And uh, before anybody else is up most of the time and uh, just sit down, have some breakfast, get some coffee, and then just try and knock out as much writing as possible. And it's actually been kind of a productive, a more productive uh, time because it's first thing in the morning, I'm on a time crunch. So it forces me to actually work instead of sitting down to say, I'm going to do something. And then I just get distracted. So, yeah. I, I understand that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kale, how about you? Has this changed your process at all? this time period? Not particularly. Um, if anything has really changed, it's just uh, the way that the industry itself has uh, changed over the past mm -hmm. several years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's gone to the point where uh, every author is pretty much their own publicist these days. And that has been really a, a challenge for me because I am, by nature, a very reserved individual. So having kind of forced myself forward has been definitely, I mean, it, it Writing is the easy part at this point, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, the industry has changed quite a bit recently. I'm glad you brought that up because it has shifted to most authors are really your own your own publicists, and uh, it's part of the hat you have to wear. Um, Ramonda, how about you? Has this changed your writing process at all during this time? I think it has changed my process slightly. Um, one of the things that has changed is I've I've seen to sort of draw other writers to me because they're looking for other ways to find out about writing, find out about publishing, find out about um, the, pub the publicist piece of things. Um, but as far as, you know, my personal writing and what has it changed uh, as far as, you know, the pandemic, I think the main thing for me has just been to be more aware and more observant in everyday life and to acknowledge those little things because they do matter. And you'll be surprised what kind of inspiration that you're able to find even in those little things if you just take the time to slow down and appreciate it. That is that is true. That's probably been the case for all of us, learning learning how to adjust. So thank you all for sharing, sharing your thoughts on that. Um, so we talked a little bit about publishing that came up in this last question, which is a great segue. Uh, so I want to kind of switch gears a bit and talk about, you know, why did you choose your specific type of publishing? So if you wouldn't this, in this answer, um, tell the, the listeners what type of publishing you utilize and, and what your reasoning for that was. Madison, can we start with you? Um, so mine was self-publishing. Um, it was just kind of out of the blue moment of me wanting to get my book to the public and just tried to get it published with the library uh, mid-continent, but it didn't work out, but I still wanted readers to read this book. So I was like, okay, I'll just learn what, how to be a self-publisher. And so I did that. I did print with uh, Mid-Continent and it was such a blessing to have it literally just a few minutes away um, to go pick up the books and just have them in my hands. Um, and I was marketing for myself and it was just such a learning process. And I was very grateful for the opportunity to realize, okay, I, this is what it means that 
everything that goes in the process of like publishing a book, but I'm doing it for myself. So I was very grateful to have the opportunity, but it's something that I want to improve in and like go into it, maybe actually get another book like actually published. But even if I'm still a self publisher, that's still great. But it's super easy. Uh, it did take me a little bit to understand certain things, but it's worth it if you want to get your book out there. And like we were all talking about the industry, it's changed recently. So there is a way to get your books out there to the public. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, JR, why did you choose your type of publishing? Yeah, so I uh, I also independently publish and uh, I use uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, uh, mostly because uh, the first uh, novel that I put out, uh, the fantasy novel that I thought would be more serious work, uh, I was try I I knew nothing about the publishing industry, so I kept I didn't understand like how do you get an agent, how do you actually contact a publisher. So I kept falling in with all these vanity press publishers, which just want your money. And uh, that was a nightmare for a few years. And then finally, somebody said, well, you know, you can publish for free on Amazon. And I went, oh, OK. <laughs> so I tried that. And so for the past uh, so for the, the past three books I've done, it's been on Amazon um, and it's just a handy route to it's become a little bit easier to publish on Amazon uh, over the years. Uh, there's still some hiccups with the, the type of uh, app and interface that they use. Um, but otherwise, it's you can get automatically connected into certain channels. They do uh, print on demand and they do uh, ebooks as well. So um, so yeah, I mean, I, the goal would uh, to hopefully someday be uh, more traditionally published, I guess, because um, I'm not good at marketing <laughs> myself. So uh, yeah, but for now, uh, yeah, doing the, the independent publishing through Amazon. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, marketing yourself is, I think, the, the writer's bane for most of us. It's not something we naturally do. Um, Kale, how about you? How did, why'd you choose the type of publishing you use? Okay. Well, I went with uh, Desert Palm Press, and they're a, uh, a lesbian-owned small press out of California. And basically, I went with them because I was really wanting to go with an LGBT uh, small press. I, I felt that, A, well, one of the things, I wanted to do uh, the traditional publishing route because it was kind of uh, a challenge to myself to create something that was good enough that it would be accepted by a commercial venture, you know. And secondly, I, I focused mostly, mostly on uh, an LGBT uh, publisher out there because, you um, I felt that I would be in better hands in that situation, that they would, they would know, understand better where I was coming from, where the characters were and all that. And also because they've played such an important part of the community over the past decades. It's, it's part of stuff. It's something that I've been wanting to be a part of for a while. And it's actually really great that I am now. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Ramonda, how about you? Why'd you choose your type of publishing? Because I had no clue what I was doing if I went the self-publishing route. <laughs> That's the honest answer. So I did actually consider doing self-publishing, um, but I understood that by this being my very first book, I didn't have any room for error and you only get one chance to do it right the first time. So um, that was really, really important to me that I lead out strongly in a way that I felt confident and um, as far as self-publishing for the first book, I just, you know, it made more sense for me to just go through a publishing house with someone that could help me walk through those individual steps and handhold me a little bit um, all the way through publication, which it turned out to be really good. It's a little bit pricey, uh, but it turned out to be the better option for me personally for the very first book. Great. Thank you. And, you know, something you all kind of hit on, which I think is an important thing for for authors and aspiring authors to remember is it really is what works best for you. There's no one way for everybody. Um, and so if you find something that works for you, then run with it. You know, not everyone wants to put on the self-publishing hats that it requires, uh, but some people love it. So, you know, don't feel like there's one that's 
one means you've made it and others you're not, that's not the case. It's just whatever works for you. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, I also want to remind everyone who's watching that we are going to be doing a Q&A at the end. So please feel free to, to chime in with comments and questions and we'll be able to get, uh, get those answered and addressed about the last 15 minutes or so of the, of the event. So thank you for that. Okay, moving on. Um, so we'll start with Madison again. Uh, Madison, what are you working on right now? Um, so I just finished my first poetry book and my the next book of the Lineage series, which is being reviewed by the publishing board at Midcontinent. Um, so kind of working on those, but you know, they're in the works, but I'm just always working on more books. Um, I have like a children's book series I'm trying to work on. I have like romantic comedy book I'm working on and like a diary style book, like just anything and everything and just continuing with uh, my audiobook series on so um, like platforms like uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts, just always working on those. That's awesome. You, you stay pretty busy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, JR, how about you? What are you working on right now? Uh, currently, uh, my goal is to try and get a, a sci-fi novel, uh, first sci-fi novel published next year. So I'm uh, working on that. It's kind of a throwback pulp uh, kind of sci-fi, like kind of 50s, 60s uh, mm -hmm. television, I would say sci-fi, not like literary sci-fi. Um, so kind of Lost in Space, Star Trek, that kind of uh, Forbidden Planet, that kind of sci-fi. Um, so I'm in the editing process for that. And then pretty soon I'll, uh, start up on volume two of the Boyd Bafflers and try and get that, uh, get the, that sequel out soon. That's great. Thank you. That's awesome. Uh, KL, how about you? What are you working on right now? Well, I recently passed, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the second book in the Kalazad series over to my beta readers and waiting for the results back on those once. I deal with all that. That's going to go off to my editors, and we'll be getting that all prepped and ready to roll. And in the meantime, I am plotting out the third book in the series and trying to get the story all straightened out. And also, uh, on the side, I'm doing a, another project that's outside of the series, more of a, a sci-fi thing than the other ones. But this is a side project just because I wanted to get it out of my head. And uh, oh, and also just recently finished up a, a quick short story. Just, uh, a little mystery just because I, I, oh, I wow. uh, okay. yeah it's just it's a Sherlock home story but it's with a twist that Holmes and Watson never actually met uh, oh that sounds fun I know a few Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts that would uh, probably love to read that so thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Ramonda how about you what are you working on currently I think the two main things that I'm working on right now, um, <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing. So you know how you have chicken soup for the soul and these little tidbits that kind of help you out through life. Well, I've kind of found that when I throw these, what I call Hail Mary prayers up into the atmosphere, that's when I actually get real results. <laughs> so I actually decided to put together um, a book that sort of collects these different situations that I've been in and what exactly happened when I said one of these raggedy prayers that somehow reached heaven, you know, um, and it's, it collects those. And it's more of an inspirational thing to, to show people that um, even in those moments when you think God is not listening, he is, and he, he's waiting to, to help you in your time of need, or even just in your time of needing a little comfort or encouragement. Uh, so there's that. And then I'm actually working on the pieces production for the spring. And I'm actually going to take um, the different pieces that are in the book, some of the different pieces of poetry and prose, and I'm going to bring them to life in a live production. Wow. You all are up to just some great stuff from all sorts of writing projects and different ways to to produce things. So that's that's wonderful. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, well, we all know that uh, writers are also readers, or we need to be reading so that we can continue perfecting our craft. Uh, so what are you currently reading? Madison, we'll start with you. I'm in the middle of reading probably 10 different books. I am a pretty slow reader, um, but one that I was reading just a little bit ago was Chaos Walking. After that film was released, I was very interested in the book. So I'm currently reading that one right now, as well as Without Remorse and Three. 
Okay. Well, I can't do multiple readings at the same time. That's just me. Uh, John, how about you? What are you currently reading? Uh, the main book that I'm reading right now is uh, called That Hideous Strength by C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis. It's uh, the third book in his uh, space trilogy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been rereading the series very slowly over the past couple of years. And so I'll have to knock that out. Um, I've got other books that I've, I'm reading off and on uh, that I've been reading throughout the year or um, I've started and stopped for whatever reason. Uh, but yeah, my Goodreads reading challenge is going to come up short if I don't uh, kick it into gear. So I'm going to be trying to knock out a lot of uh, books over the next next month and a half. Best of luck with that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Kale, <laughs> uh, how about you? What are you currently reading? Well, uh, I'm just wrapping up um, a reread of an all favorite of mine called Subterranean Worlds by Walter Kathleen Minkle. It's a really interesting book. It's kind of a history of uh, hollow earth beliefs. It starts mm -hmm. all the way from like uh, the original emergence myths of uh, original people that they had, and then goes all the way up to kind of the, the whole new age UFOs under the earth kind of ideas. And it just covers the, the complete history. And it's a really fascinating book. And we're just um, really well written. And I was able to actually pick it up when it first came out many years ago, and it's been a favorite of mine ever since. Uh, let's see, I'm also reading a book called Alternate Channels, which is a history of queer characters, how they were depicted in ch uh, television, going out since the 50s all the way up to the present day. And uh, The Language of Thieves, which is an interesting book I just ran into by accident in the library the other day. It's all about this language called Rothwelsch which was kind of a, a thieves' cant that was found in Germany and other parts of Europe uh, during the 19th and 20th centuries. And it's all about this guy's journey into looking into the history of it and the history of his family as well. And I, I love language. I love actually like specialty languages like, like Rothwell, Polari, Pedalus French, Hobo Sign, all these kinds of things. So this is a really fun book for me to be reading. I, yeah, and so basically, I just love me some nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's quite all right. Yeah, I, you, you mentioned uh, going back and like rereading a, a favorite. I do that all the time. I try to read new books, but I, I go back to the, like the 10 to 20 books that I read every year and just, I don't know why, but I do. So anyway, uh, Romanda, what are you currently reading? I'm actually reading a book uh, by a good friend of mine, and it's called Why Worship, and it's by Camille McMickle. And it's actually um, a very beautiful book that talks about where worship comes from within you. Why do we actually worship? What, what place does that come from inside of us that allows us to express ourselves on a much deeper kind of level? And it's been so insightful for me because um, writing is a form of worship to me personally. You are, as a writer, a, uh, opening yourself to all kinds of different opportunities to touch other people. And you have to do that from a place of truth and authenticity. And so her book has been really interesting for me in that particular regard. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, so as we're kind of thinking about the people in the audience, we've got some potential um, either authors that are working on a project or want to work on a project or something or in the process of, um, do you have any writing tips for them? So Madison, do you have any writing tips for folks who are either starting or kind of starting to move forward with this? Yeah, um, just don't be afraid to write. Um, just leave space for cre creativity in your day. Um, my family, they love to, I don't know, they love this part of our vacations, but I think they enjoy telling people um is every vacation we've been on since i was 13 i've always had at least one journal maybe two or three i'm just always writing in the car i just always bring it with me and i like make sure i have time for it um and just always have a note card or a journal with me if i know okay i don't really have to like be attentive to something like if i have free time oh i can just you know leave space for creativity and it's like the best thing to do. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, JR, how about you? Do you have any writing tips for folks? Yeah, I guess uh, coming from the place of life that I'm in where I'm always busy, um, I guess my main writing tip would be just do whatever it takes to write. Uh, if you 
feel like I, I feel like most people who want to write and don't usually just say, well, I, I never have the time. But if you really want to do something, you'll make the time for it. So you just have to get creative. Maybe it means you sacrifice sleep in order to do some writing. Maybe it means you uh, sacrifice watching a show or whatever, but uh, just doing whatever it takes to write and finding the best way to uh, cultivate writing. So like for me, getting up early before work and getting maybe an hour, maybe 30 minutes in of writing time, uh, that's just been helpful. It just kind of freshened up the experience and was able uh, to knock things out more uh, consistently versus doing it the way that I was doing it, where I would try and write in the evening and I was always tired and didn't want to write. So uh, it's, yeah, just do whatever it takes and figure it out. Like if uh, maybe the traditional format doesn't work, maybe it works to write it down on paper and then type it up. Maybe it works to use the cloud in some way so that uh, your document is available anywhere so that you could work on it at work on break. You can work on it before you go to sleep, you can work on it in the morning, whenever, um, but just doing whatever it takes to get it done. Awesome. Thank you. That's a great tip. Uh, Kale, how about you? Do you have any writing tips for folks? I just want to follow up on what JR there said. Um, one of the things I like to do is I've got a base, I've got an alarm set, basically. At 9 p.m. every night, my little clock goes off and says it's time to write. So I know, because uh, I, I work better when I've got kind of a regular plan together. And so when I know that it's nine o'clock, it's writing time, that gets me to sit down and actually do the writing. Uh, another thing uh, I will say is um, give yourself an easy goal. Or, I mean, I usually just write, I'll get to the next page. That's my rule. Get to the next page every day. And that is deliberately a simple goal just because I know. I can always do that. There's and there's no day that I can't do that. And so I'm not going to fall behind. And it's easy to get discouraged if you miss a couple of days. But if you have something that easy, you can always do it. You can always keep the flow going and just keep on. And if you want to write more, hey, there's no rules that you can't. And the, uh, and the third thing I will say is when you're first when you're writing that first draft, don't worry too much about if it's perfect or if, it, if all the pieces come together or even if the characters' names are right. Somebody, I don't remember who it was, they said, uh, the job of the second draft is to be good, but the job of the first draft is just to exist. So I'm like, you're just getting the story down on paper or on file or wherever, and then you can come back and get it together. So just above all things, just get it down on paper. That is great advice. Just put it down there and then, yeah, you can come back to it. Perfect. Um, and Ramonda, how about you? Do you have any writing tips for folks? I think uh, probably one of the first things that I would say is get get still in your mind. We don't do enough of that to me personally. We just don't do enough of that. There's so many things competing for our time uh, and our mental space, our attention. It's, it's social media, it's family, it's screens and images everywhere. It's getting harder and harder just to find a quiet, still place. And so you have to... Um, to me, kind of get to somewhere that's quiet in your environment, and then you can get quiet in your head so that you can hear the things that need to be written. Um, the second thing I'd say is, and this kind of goes to Mr. Underdown's statement that, you know, if it's important, you're going to make time, and, and that's what it is. People do make time for what's important to them, so you really have to ask yourself, how important is this to you really? And at the end of the day, your writing is so not about you. It's about all the other people who need what you have to give. And if you look at it that way, you will make it a priority. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. You all have some, some wonderful, wonderful tips. Thank you for that. Uh, and I know we do have some people who are chiming with questions. So thank you for continuing to do so. Um, we'll have a few more few more moments and then we'll open up for Q&A, but please keep sending those questions and comments in. We, we greatly appreciate that. Um, so on that same note of writing tips, um, I, I love a good writing book or craft book or any of those websites or things. Uh, do you have some writing resources, craft book websites that you would recommend? We'll start with you, Madison. So I think it was in high school when I found this uh, creative space called Hit Record. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it's like 
different types of creative platforms are connected with it. It can be writing, photography, videography, like just a whole plethora of things. Um, but there were so many writing prompts and it just like my wheels started to spin. I was like, oh, that's like a really cool prompt. Let me just like think about it for a little bit and let me create a story. So that was one of my favorite things that I found. I wish I found it sooner, um, but it's just a really cool experience. And also I would recommend like taking like even just like one class at a community college, the creative writing class that helped me um, this past two years in college, just my writing has excelled so much from that class and just hearing from other writers and just my craft has changed and I like explored more into poetry, which I was scared to do, but found out, okay, I'm like not that bad in it. And actually having people read my book and like hearing what they think instead of just, I hope they really like it or I hope that they'll buy my next book. It was just a really cool community. So those are my two things I would recommend for any writer or anyone looking into writing. Great, thank you very much. Uh, JR, how about you? Uh, well, any resources, books, websites you'd recommend for folks? Uh, I, I don't read a lot of writing books. Uh, I tend to I, I tend to learn off of observation, so I'll just read a lot of different books and try and pick up what I like from different authors. Um, one book that was particularly helpful for me is called uh, Word Smithy by Douglas Wilson, and it's a very very short book. Um, so if uh, you're kind of daunted by some writing books that are really thick, this one's really short. Um, but that was a pretty helpful resource because it's not necessarily about like, how do you write? It was more of um, like, how can you better your writing and become a better writer? And like, what are things that you could do to, to do that? Um, otherwise, lately, I've kind of gotten into listening to podcasts that highlight independent authors. Um, there's uh, the uh, Prolific Creator pod podcast by uh, another Kansas City author, Ryan Pelton. Um, I've listened to uh, quite a bit of those. He typically interviews independent authors and um, there's the Word Slinger podcast, uh, Story Embers. There's honestly just go to Spotify, type in writing podcast and you will just throw a dart at your computer screen. You'll hit one. Um, you also break your screen, but you'll find a <laughs> podcast in the process. Um, but yeah, so right now it's mostly been podcasting and listening to uh, other authors talk about their craft and their experiences. Great, thank you. It's good, good resources. Uh, Kale, how about you? Any resources, craft books, websites you'd recommend? Not honestly, not really. I, I mean, just the main things I've just found were just to find the kind of books that you like and that you want to follow, and that's how. And then just read them, not just you know, like for fun, but read them critically, like mm -hmm. really take them apart, see how they work in the way that they do, and just kind of. We be really analytical about them, and then also, I mean, it's always good to have a style book uh, by your side. And if you wind up with a traditional publisher, they usually tell you, "Hey, we like to use this such, such and such style." So it really helps to have that by uh, you, so you can actually refer to it and catch things before they get sent off to the editor. And uh, yeah, just but honestly, other than that, it's just read as much as you possibly can which is wonderful advice. And you're absolutely right as far as reading books you love and then finding out why they work is a good a good tool. Thank you. Uh, Ramonda, how about you? Any writing resources, craft books, or websites you'd recommend for individuals? Well, I personally like to use Anchor um, to just record some of the things that I'm thinking. Um, yes, it's good to have a variety of tools at your disposal in terms of just capturing some of those little breadcrumb ideas and, and thoughts that you might have on, on a piece or something that inspires you. So um, I like using Anchor because I'm actually going to use that for uh, more or less the foundation going into my audio book. Um, but I don't, I don't actually read a lot of writing books because that's, I'm not, I'm not more, um, I'm not the type of writer that goes so much by tradition and the rules and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do works for the people that like my work. Um, the other thing that I would say is I, I like to read books 
one of the books that I'm reading is, uh, uh, or have read is called Click by George Frazier. And it's funny because he's a very um, dynamic speaker, but you can't speak without knowing how to write something down. So I like reading his book because it shows you how to connect with people. And as writers, we have to know how to do that. It's not just write down these great, awesome ideas and cross your fingers and hope somebody likes it. You have to be able to tap into what matters to your readers and write what you feel, but in a way that connects with them emotionally and that they find relevance in. And so that's why I like Click because it talks about how to connect with people in a way that matters. That's awesome, thank you. And thank you all for, for sharing. Um, we're actually, we've got about 15 minutes or so left. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch gears a bit. We've got a number of people who have, who have written in some questions. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put these up on the screen and uh, whoever would like to respond, feel free. And if everyone does, great. And if we just have one person, that works as well. Uh, so this first one's from Jennifer, uh, says, what's your favorite genre to read? Um, dystopian, and I know it's not really like a genre, but like World War II, like historical true stories like Anne Frank and Cory Ten Boom are honestly my favorite ones. And also like The Hobbit and just like those types of, you know, traditional classic books are my favorite. Yeah, over the past few years, I've noticed uh, my favorite, maybe not my favorite genre, but the genre I tend to lean toward is sci-fi. And then I started getting depressed reading some sci-fi books. <laughs> so uh, a couple years ago when the library did the uh, uh, fantasy theme for the reading challenge, mm -hmm. it reminded me that, oh, I really actually like fantasy. So it's kind of like sci-fi, but more positive tend to, tend, uh, typically. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I kind of like a little bit of every genre of sci-fi, uh, fantasy, mysteries, westerns, a um, little bit of everything. Awesome. I personally love nonfiction myself. I like to look into I just any kind of book that talks about some aspect of the world that I wasn't previously aware of. I love those in kind of like history of pop culture, history of civilizations, any kind of the minute of the world. I've got old directories of um, ephemera from the 19th and 18th centuries and all kinds of weird stuff like that. It's like a, it's like a good documentary, if you know what I mean. I do, yes. <laughs> I kind of like sci-fi, um, but I, I like a sprinkling of so many other things. But um, here's my confession like i got this thing about ufo science fiction probably a little too much <laughs> but um the whole conspiracy theory uh thing I, I really like that um i try not to get too deep into it but it's really intriguing so yeah probably sci-fi awesome thank you thank you jennifer for putting that question in um we have one from Kelsey. Uh, would you ever want one of your books to be turned into a movie? Um, yes. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to school to become a screenwriter. And with Pendants, I started writing the screenplay for it. So I would say yes, all of them. <laughs> but yeah. That's a great question. I've not seen someone ask that before. <laughs> Yeah, my first book that I published, uh, Plethora, I, I would be fine with turning that into a movie. Uh, the Boyd Bafflers, I kind of wrote it in as like a television series format more so. So that would probably work better as like a Netflix thing in, in my view. <laughs> Something you could just binge. If that happens, ever let, you know, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm at I would mind seeing Kalasad being turned into a movie. I kind of imagined it as one in my head as I was writing it. That being said, it probably won't ever happen, but I have actually come up with some ideas for actual screenplays. One of these days I want to sit down and actually write in between novels, but perhaps one day it'll happen. That'd be cool. 
I would definitely say for not for pieces because this is not this is not designed in the way that I think would work for a screenplay. But the second book in the pieces series, I think, is going to be excellent for a screenplay. So yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Kelsey, for putting that in there. Uh, this question is from Ruby. Do you ever use voice notes or other ways of capturing your thoughts or organizing your stories? I've never used voice notes, um, just like notes on my phone or just like scraps of paper and like collecting them in my purse or taking them home. It's like, all right, got to put this all together because it's like 40 different scenes in a book that's just scrambled on my desk. I have to rearrange them. But yeah. Yeah, similar for me. It's just uh, get a post-it note at work if I have an idea, quickly jot it down, put it in my pocket and hope I don't put it in the wash um, or uh, just making a note in my phone and uh, trying to remember that it's there when I need to write it. <laughs> Yeah, just pretty much. I have any any book or anything that I write, I have a, I have a separate notes file that goes along with it, and I just dump everything in there. Awesome. I'm kind of um, uh, the scraps of paper here, and sometimes it's napkins, whatever little piece of back of an envelope. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll write on just about anything, but. Uh, in terms of voice notes, not so much voice notes, but again, I do like to jot a few things down audibly with Anchor, which is a, a pretty handy tool. Uh, you can put that app on your phone. It is free. Um, also with Anchor, you can monetize through that um, that application as well. So it's nice. Oh, that's cool. Thank you all. And thank you, Ruby, for, for that question. Uh, we'll remind everybody. Um, that I put the event survey link in the chat. Uh, so please feel free to fill that out after the event. We'd love to hear your thoughts. I also put a link to the Story Center uh, as far as our resources. We have courses, uh, as, as Madison mentioned, uh, publication options, a Story Center collection. So those are some things that you might be interested in checking out. Now we do have some more questions from, from folks in the audience, which is great. Um, another one from Jennifer. Do you ever find that you relate to one specific character in each of your books? I would say yes. I The main character in my books are mainly females. And so it feels like, what would I do in this situation? And like even to a specific, like detailed, um, each character has the same scar that I do. Cause it's like a little bit of me is in them and it's like, I relate to them in some way and they relate to me just like, I don't know, it just feels like me in that situation and that story is how I write my characters. Yeah, one of the characters in the Boyd Bafflers is based on me, so I, I definitely relate to, to him. Um, I, I do find though that typically, even even in the Boyd Bafflers, the, the character that's based on me is just kind of more of a doofus uh, than I hope I am in real life. Um, but in other stuff that I've written, I kind of, what I've kind of noticed is that there, it's not necessarily a specific character, but it might be, there's something in one character that I relate to. And then there's something in another character that I relate to as well. And that it just kind of like spreads out. Like even in the Boyd Bafflers, the, the true main character, he has a level of wisdom that I wish I had. And, um, so I don't know, I guess it's, uh. There's usually somebody that's a little bit more like me, but um, I guess because it's all coming from my head, there's just a little bit of me and everybody. <laughs> I get that, yeah. I would say yes, too. Um, you know, there, there are some characters that I create um, because they represent a very small aspect of me in some way, but never completely a copy of me, if you will. There's some things that are more or less um, <laughs> almost avatar-like, if you know, if you can look at it from that perspective. And I'll say now, uh, Rebecca, one of the main characters in my book, is definitely a bit of a parody of myself, and just taking on some of, the, some of my aspects and 
playing with them, having a little fun. She's a little too vain, a little too reckless, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I get to poke fun at myself through that character. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you all. And thank you, Jennifer, for uh, that, that question as well. Oh, we have a couple more. So we've got, uh, I'm glad so many of you have sent in your questions. Thank you for this. Uh, so Kelsey writes, how do you motivate yourself to keep writing when you're feeling uninspired? Um, I think just really pushing it. Like I have to get this done. I have to meet the deadline. I want to write something, even if I don't feel inspired. Sometimes that's when a different side of craft I find like maybe if I'm not ex like really inspired I like go towards poetry I'm like okay how am I feeling why am I not feeling inspired in that kind of route I did actually for a good year and a half not write at all which was very strange for me to not write at all um, but I don't know if I'd ever do that again but writer's block is real <laughs> Yeah, I kind of find that, and this is, uh, some people say this is bad writing advice to read uh, a book in the genre that you're writing in. Um, but I actually find that it kind of challenges me if I read a good uh, book, like if I'm writing a sci-fi book, for instance, and I read a good sci-fi book, it kind of challenges me to go, okay, well, this is how this person is presenting their universe. How do I present my universe? And uh, that's typically a good way to help motivate me to want to write again. I've always heard the thing is you, you don't want to wait for inspiration to show up because you, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. The thing is to basically build yourself a, a discipline. You got to be able to say, okay, at five o'clock, nine o'clock, whenever I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do X amount of work. And just, you have to do that and stick to it and get that habit in you so that even if whether you're inspired or not, you're still sitting down and getting the writing done. It's, it's basically, if you want to treat it, if you want it to be something that's taken seriously, you have to take it seriously yourself and uh, treat it like a job, really, mm -hmm. and, and make sure it gets done. Exactly. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, for me, it's it's the exact opposite of what you just said. <laughs> for me, I don't write when I'm not inspired because it's not authentic for me. It, you're coming from a place of turning your writing into a job. And that's not, that's, for me, that's what I don't want. <laughs> you know, uh, there's different strokes for different folks. And, you know, what works for you may not work for someone else. And so you have to get to a place of, digging into when you do feel inspired, what was it that triggered that? What was it that made you feel inspired? Was it an interaction with someone? Was it something that happened to you? Was it something that you saw in nature? You kind of have to keep track mentally of what inspired you to write the last time and, and really tap into that. But for me personally, if I'm not inspired, I don't write because it's, you know, if you're if you're just writing out of the feeling of necessity versus this is this is something that is coming from a, a really authentic place versus a have to. It, it just feels very different for me. I'm not able to write if I'm not inspired. It, it's not real for me. Thank you. And I, I think that probably comes down to uh, what you're writing and kind of what your goals are. All that sure. wraps up. So, yeah. So thank you for sharing all that. I really appreciate that. Uh, we are getting very close. Um, we have a couple questions left. I, I apologize if we can't get to all of them, um, but I am going to throw this one up here for Kayla. Uh, Kelsey, thank you for that. And this will be possibly the last question we can do. Uh, what is your writing kryptonite? I just thought that was a great question. <laughs> um i would have to say my dyslexia it's like both good and bad but it's probably the strongest thing that weighs what i'm writing and how i'm writing just because being diagnosed with dyslexia it was so hard for me to like form sentences properly and grant like the grammar sometimes is not right and so that was like a big piece of it but i have grown in it and i have an amazing editor and it's also a strong strong suit of mine of the creative side of it of, and using it, not just seeing it as a weakness, but 
that is somewhat of the kryptonite, but not really. Thank you. At this stage in life, uh, it's exhaustion uh, for me. If I if I'm just too tired <laughs> to even think, I'm not writing. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it's not so much the writing. It's like I said before, the promotion, trying to get out there. Once the book's done, getting people to, to notice it and to read it. That's the weird hard part. For me. Absolutely. Yeah, that is tough. You know, um, for me, it's, it's noise. I, it's very difficult for me to focus and to write with too much noise. Um, I, can, I can write when there is like maybe uh, smooth jazz or just um, really soft instrumentals or something like that. I, I can write to that. Um, but yeah, noise is a big problem. Uh, it needs to be quiet for me to be able to really hear the words coming to me. And um, I, I think that you, in knowing, in knowing what it takes for you to write, you have to also allow yourself the room and the breath to, to create that as well. Because the previous question was about that inspiration, right? Mm -hmm. But if you don't allow yourself to be in the type of environment or get into the right type of headspace that does inspire you, you create your own kryptonite, whether you realize it or not. So I think that um, that's, yeah, for me, it's noise. It's, it's noise. <laughs> you got to keep <laughs> it <laughs> I understand I'm actually wearing noise canceling headphones because I also need that same thing <laughs> uh, when I write. Well, we we are out of time. I uh, thank you so much for all the questions that were sent in. I apologize for those we weren't able to get to. Uh, but what I'd like to do uh, is give everyone an opportunity to have the uh, just to kind of re-mention your name, your book. Uh, we can repost the book cover and your website, and that way everyone can get another chance of, of seeing what you have. So if possible, we could start with Madison. Hi again. So for my book, Pendants, um, it is my first book being published, and actually I'm having a holiday sale. It'll be 40% off. If you go to my website, you can see the dates that it is on sale and you can order through my website. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Madison. Uh, JR? Yeah, so I'm JR Underdown and uh, I published The Boyd Bafflers. It's uh, available on Amazon or probably anywhere you can find it electronically. It's uh, available as an ebook or uh, print on demand. Uh, so you, if you, whichever uh, uh, avenue you prefer, you can have it that way. Um, and then I, I'd also like to point out that if uh, you go to my website, there's a bibliography page where you can find uh, literally everything that I've published uh, up to this point, anything major uh, other than what's on the blog. Um, so you can see the other books I published as well, short stories that have been published elsewhere. So thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, KL? Okay. Well, I'm KL Mitchell, and I'm uh, just read my book, The Road to Tell God. You see it right here. It's the sun off. There we go. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, it is, of course, available on Amazon and, uh, and on demand or electronic format. Or if you go to the website below, you can get directly from the publisher. And that's actually a little better because it helps us it actually you get a bigger uh, share of that. And that keeps a uh, small independent publisher afloat. So um, any, uh, by all means, please check it out. And Got some of the other authors that are our website as well while you're there. Great, thank you. And Ramonda. Oh. Ramonda, I think you might be muted. Can you hear me? Is that better? Yes, there we go. Thank you. Okay. My name is Ramonda, and you can find my book on Amazon in paperback as well as in the ebook format. And to get the most recent updates and um, any types of PR uh, projects, things like that, I would go on Facebook under Ramonda's Pieces. 
Great. Thank you so much. Well, I just want to, again, thank all of you authors for being here, taking the time to uh, to speak with us, answering questions. Thank you all for sending in your questions. I also want to thank Gennard and Ruby at Post Life Media for uh, doing the behind the scenes all day for us. This has been wonderful. Um, and I know we were just kind of wrapping up, but I wanted to open up just briefly. If any of you have anything you would like to say before we close the event. Just thank you. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. And if uh, if you read a book, uh, any of these books, make sure you go to uh, Goodreads, Amazon, anywhere, and uh, leave a rating and review form. Absolutely. Absolutely. Reviews are important. Great. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for uh, authors. Thank you for attending. Thank you for uh, Post Live Media. And uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care, everyone. <laughs>